Hello and welcome to episode three. In this episode, we're going to explore the concept of digital wallets. So by the end of this episode, we will have learned what do we mean by the digital wallet pattern? How does it work in practice? And what are the prerequisites for this pattern to work? So if you're ready, let's get started. The digital wallet pattern. Well, central to this second pattern is the concept of a verifiable credential. Blockchain is often misunderstood as yet another data sharing protocol, just another technology to share information, but in a distributed way. Let's examine this for a moment and get a few things straight. Blockchain is not a protocol for sending and delivering data between systems, but a shared ledger that creates permanent digital records. Blockchain uses cryptographic methods and a distributed consensus that creates trust between disparate systems and users. Blockchain creates an immutable and decentralized record of logs. In practical terms, this means that blockchain can facilitate checks on the integrity, origin, etc. of official documents without the need to contact their issuing entity each time. So how does this work? Well, conceptually, the model is similar to a wallet of documents. However, instead of verifications through physical checks, these are now possible using digital means thanks to cryptography and blockchain technology. In this pattern, official documents or credentials are fundamentally a claim or a set of claims about someone or something. These claims are then minted in a digital document usually known as a verifiable credential. They're confirmed by a competent authority using electronic signatures, and then they're recorded on a blockchain. Now, it's important to highlight that the blockchain stores unique cryptographic hashes alongside other key attributes, but it doesn't store the data itself. The verifiable credential can contain claims about the citizen having a given nationality, holding a certain degree, or having a driving license, for example. And they can be verified at any time using cryptographic methods. Once issued, the data and documents can usually be stored on a digital wallet by the citizen or organization who is the holder of that information. The citizen or organization can then create verifiable presentations containing data from one or several credentials as supporting evidence to real life transactions they want to perform, such as changing their address or applying for a job. These verification processes are automatable. That means we can automatically verify things like the hash of the document, so we can verify the integrity of the information. We can automatically verify its issuer, so who issued this official document. And we can automatically verify the holder, as in who the official document was issued to. Unlike the first pattern, any verifier checking the authenticity of a digital document, aka this verifiable presentation, can rely on cryptographic verifications without needing to contact its issuer. Furthermore, it's typically up to the holder of the document to share it with the verifier. This means that the holder controls the information that it wants to share with others. Furthermore, selective disclosure of information may also be possible when information is standardized and advanced cryptographic methods, such as zero knowledge proofs, become the norm. Similar to the previous pattern, verifiable credentials depend on several infrastructural elements. We need a fully functioning, shared and publicly available blockchain network that can be shared and trusted by European public administrations. We also need a digital identification framework. This is a crucial prerequisite for this pattern to work, as we saw in the first pattern. In a typical blockchain paradigm, that means that every public administration, business, and citizen would need what we call a decentralized ID, or DID. DIDs are a new type of identifier that enable verifiable, decentralized digital identity. And finally, citizens and businesses would need to have a trusted and secure digital wallet connected to the blockchain to hold their DID and their documents. 
So what are the prerequisites for this pattern to work? Well, the European Commission and the EBP members are working on a pan-European initiative called the European Blockchain Services Infrastructure. And it's there to address both the technical and legal challenges that we face. For example, at present, those DIDs or decentralized identifiers don't contain information on the actual person or organization associated to it. We need a solution so that we can link a certain DID reliably to its associated entity, be that a business or a person. And we need to do it in a way that can be verified by other parties when needed, and of course, consented to by the holder of the document. This is just one of the many legal challenges still faced by this emerging pattern. We're working on this issue and other issues related to privacy and legal alignment. So let's wrap up this episode. What did we learn? Well, for us to be able to share information that can be trusted, there are prerequisites that need to be in place. We need a legal and technical framework for trusted digital identities and electronic signatures. We also learned that new solutions will continue to emerge to support the way we share data and documents in a way we can trust. Blockchain and the verifiable credentials are an excellent example. What's important to remember is that both patterns, the digital post office that we explained in episode two and the pattern that we described in this episode are complementary. Both of them enable transactions to be carried out online without the need for physical checks. And both patterns are part of a modern e-government digital infrastructure. This means that digital post offices will be able to connect to and benefit from a blockchain infrastructure and the digital wallet and the other way around. The main challenge will be for governments to have a good understanding of both patterns so that they can apply them in their digital infrastructure in an efficient and effective way to build great digital services and achieve the objectives such as the once only principle. Finally, blockchain and verifiable credentials mean we, citizens like you and me, will have more control over our data. We'll have what they call data sovereignty or self-sovereign identity. However, to make this a reality, governments will need to provide guidance on legal and compliance issues and clear answers on privacy concerns. We also need the GovTech ecosystem to make secure applications with a great user experience for people to make the most of these new technologies. Like with the internet, it takes an ecosystem to design, build and deploy the infrastructure and applications that allow society to reap the benefits of new technologies. Engaging these ecosystems should be part of the strategy for governments at national level as well as at EU level. Over the next few years, we're gonna see a lot of exciting things happen through the Shaping Europe's Digital Future Initiative and the upcoming Digital Europe Programme. This is a really exciting time. Thank you for staying the course so far. I know that if you're just getting into this topic, some of the concepts are not easy to grasp at first. I struggled myself. So if you feel like it might be useful, why not watch the videos again? Nevertheless, maybe take a break or grab a cup of coffee first. And when you're ready, join me on the next episodes, where we're going to look at EBSI in more detail and some really exciting use cases, as well as the techniques that will hopefully inspire you to design and later kickstart your own EBSI pilot. I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Thanks for watching.